And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to be using the Crimea game, most recent game in the series, to uh, demonstrate a little bit more uh, about the game, how it works, and we're going to focus our attention a little bit more on, on supply and actual flow of the game. What I've got set up here is the uh, Odessa scenario, and uh, this is kind of a cool little scenario. It fits in a 11 by 17 inch uh, insert uh, that comes with the game, so it's not part of the, the, the regular map sheet that's used. And so it gives you just an, a small tabletop footprint. Um, doesn't take up a lot of space, and it's a good uh, good way to learn the system. Now, the Odessa scenario has a couple special rules that are important to uh, understand, and I'm bending a couple of those so uh, for the purpose of the demo. Uh, one of those, the special rules that uh, need to be kept in mind is the uh, that Odessa is cut off from the rest of Russia. So ordinarily, if one uh, major city is connected with another major city, it, it can be used as a uh, something as a quasi supply source. Uh, and that's um, that's actually not going to be the case here. You cannot trace general supply to Odessa as a major city. That said, Odessa is a major port with a naval base there, so the capacity of the port is going to be able to provide a limited amount of supply uh, to a certain number of uh, steps. I believe it's going to be 60 steps of Soviet units, which is more than enough for the size of this scenario. Uh, the, it, all units are, are considered to be in... Uh, uh, full attack supply, so MSQs, mobile supply units, are not used in this scenario. However, I am going to go ahead and use them in this scenario, and I'm going to do it in this way. I'm going to say that the Soviets have two uh, wagons that will be uh, the most that they can accumulate. Uh, those two, just those two um, uh, wagons, and uh, that those those wagons uh, are going to come in on uh, only even numbered turns. Just to show you how these things work. Soviets aren't going to be doing a whole lot of attacking, just maybe uh, small localized counterattacks in this scenario. Um, the Germans, I'm going to say that they've got uh, four wagons and two trucks, and they, that they get two MSUs every turn, because um, they're going to be the, the axis that are going to be the ones that are attacking mostly in the scenario. So uh, I've got everything set up. Everybody's in their starting position. So uh, get out our sequence of play here and we can get started. Now this particular vassal module is actually pretty cool because it's got all the charts in it. Uh, let me just get you guys familiarized with the uh, vassal module here. If you click on the uh, the reinforcements track, uh, it's the button on the top of your toolbar that says reinf. Uh, just click on that and uh, that's going to show you the reinforcements that are scheduled for the game. It also has the all-important Sevastopol uh, holding box. So I'm going to move these guys out of the way so you can see it. Uh, Sevastopol holding box is going to hold uh, naval units and also land units. Uh, it costs two naval movement points to move your ships from uh, Sevastopol to Odessa. So that's actually kind of an important uh, thing to remember in the game. That's where those guys are located. Um, the charts, if you click on the charts button on the toolbar, you'll see the charts for the game. And then there is a uh, there's little tra uh, little buttons the across the top. You can just click on those, or maybe they're tabs on a PC. Uh, just click on those, and it'll show you the various different tables, and we'll try to uh, let you know what tables we're using as we uh, consult them. Um, the Axis button will open up the Axis player's um, display. This is where you're going to tra track uh, victory points. Uh, you're going to track uh, uh, losses and replacements here. Um, Obviously, in this game, in this particular scenario, um, we're going to actually track all Axis losses, not just armor or uh, artillery. Under normal circumstances, armor and artillery losses will convert into victory points. When you lose uh, a certain number of uh, steps of armor, uh, I believe it, it is going to be five. When you lose uh, five steps of armor and or artillery, you'll see there's an asterisk there on the track. This will return to the one space, and the victory points will be adjusted by minus one for the Axis. Um, same thing is going to be true of the uh, of the Soviets. Um, these these player displays are where you're going to track where uh, you, you rebuild your units. Um, see what else is going on in this. Uh, you're going to have your area all your area units are in there. So this is going to be something that we're going to have to consult from time to time. The Soviet play display is just about the same, except there's no victory point display. We are also going to track all Soviet losses, not just armor and artillery. Now, when that marker reaches the 8 spot, then uh, there's going to be one VP for the axis. And then the marker returns to the zero space. So that's how uh, 
that's how these displays are going to work in the game. And so I just wanted you to let let you know that that's how how we'll be consulting those. Now uh, there's also a button that says play. That's going to show you the sequence of play. And so just uh, get get things started here. We're going to go ahead and consult that particular um, window. So click the play button there on your toolbar. You can close out all the other little windows. And we're going to start off with weather determination. Uh, if you click on the button on your toolbar, it says TRT. Open up the turn record track. And uh, the game actually begins. It's the, it's the Axis player that's going to start the, uh, the initiative here. Uh, for the first two games, uh, we're actually not going to roll for weather. Uh, there's a little notation A on turn 27 and 28. And so if you look down at the bottom, it notes it says usually use historic weather which is going to be dry so the weather's dry and just to note that I'm going to go ahead and put a marker in there to show the weather the weather is dry this particular turn if the weather was uh, turns out to be mud or something like that you can only have uh, two uh, I believe it is you can have no more than two consecutive mud turns uh, if you if you roll up anything other uh, other than uh, a dry or a storm on the uh, on the third turn then uh, you have to re-roll it. So that's where you're going to have to use this marker. It's usually only um, necessary to mark uh, when a mud turn has been rolled up. So that's that. Well, that's all we're going to have to do for weather. So weather's real easy. Let's move along to the next step. We're going to look at supply determination. Uh, supply sources in this game, um, the Soviets, let's check them first. They were going to be really easy. Uh, they're all in supply. Uh, supplies are going to be blocked by zone of control in the game. We talked about that last time, so I'm not going to go into all that. Um, there are uh, there are ports in this game. There are minor ports, major ports, and then there's what's called anchorages. I'm going to draw your attention over here to the uh, Hex 1714, where I just moved the 74th Machine Gun Battalion. Uh, I just moved him out of the way to show that there's a town located there, and it's a town on the coast. Um, a town on the coast is defined as an anchorage in the game. And so if you open up the charts on the toolbar and click on the Naval tab or the Naval button at the top, you can see here the port characteristics chart. And it says for an anchorage that uh, the port capacity for general supply is six stacking points. We'll be able to trace to that location. So that will be able to, you know, to fund, uh, as it were, seven steps of Soviets. Uh, there's another anchorage that's going to be able to supply them, and that's located way over here in hex 2910 where there's a uh, coastal battery there and then also hex 2509 is also an anchorage which can also uh, fuel supply. Uh, Odessa itself is a major port and inside that port there is a base. Now it doesn't say this on the charts I don't believe but it is stated in the playbook that a uh, the, the uh, capacity of a uh, port is doubled if there's a base located there. So for a major port like Odessa, you can ordinarily have uh, 30 units be able to trace to it. But since there's a base, I just put them on the top of the stack. Uh, since there's a base there in Odessa, uh, that can actually fuel 60 um, stacking points worth. And that's more than enough for the, uh, the whole of the Soviet order of battle here. So we don't even have to worry about that. All the Soviets are in supply. For the Axis, their supply um, is actually not mentioned in the playbook. I emailed Tony Curtis about this, and he told me my, my presumption was was that the um, the railroad and or the major road leading off the uh, west edge of the map that those would be the supply sources, and he said that is correct. So the supply sources for the uh, the German army are going to be uh, this hex here, where I put a road net marker. And I'm going to clone that and put it over here on the railroad here. So those are going to be your supply sources. You are in supply, in general supply, if you can trace uh, seven hexes back to a, a supply source. Now, here's where road nets are going to come into play. Uh, road nets are uh, a, a string of road hexes, maximum length of 21 hexes worth of roads leading from a, a supply source. And so what we have here is we've set up a road net. So all of these major road hexes, up to 21 hexes in length, which is the entire, it's more, you know, the entire length of this road, stretching from hex uh, 1008 to hex uh, 2301, is well within the 21 hex limit. So that entire road can be considered a supply source. It's a way to uh, make your supply source go a little bit further than the actual uh, map edge hex. 
So that's going to be an entire supply source. Also the railroad there, um, I believe that that railroad is not restricted, but I could be wrong on that. At any rate, it's not a big deal because the, the highway is going to be your, your primary means of uh, connecting supply. Also in this scenario, there is no um, railroad conversion. You're not going to be converting uh, uh, the gauge of the railroads in this particular scenario like you will in, in scenarios in Kiev to Rostov and other titles. So let me go ahead and delete this marker. So all of these, uh, these Romanians are going to be in supply because they can trace within seven hexes to that road net. Now, by the way, that road net is actually going to be only 15 hexes max if the weather is mud. So that can sometimes, um, that can sometimes slow things down a little bit because I think the, the supply source will be reduced just a little bit. The road net's going to be shortened a bit uh, during mud, but that's not the case now. Uh, if you found guys that were out of supply, you can also, uh, well, let me get to that in a minute. Let's talk about the uh, Romanians south of the Dniester River. There's actually two units. There's a 21st, uh, the reduced 21st uh, Romanian division here in Hex uh, 1213 and the 7th Romanian Cavalry here in Hex 1515. Uh, both of these boys are, are uh, south of the Dniester River. And supply line, they cannot trace supply across an unbridged major river. And that is what is designated by the, the Nista River. Uh, also, if you are in swamp, let me get my chart here. If you are in swamp terrain, which is uh, hexes 1111, um, hexes 1212, and hexes 1312, uh, that particular um, terrain there is considered to be swamp. And you cannot trace supply into that during uh, dry weather uh, or mud weather unless there's a road. During frost, you can, but that's not the case at the present. So both of these guys, the 21st and the 7th uh, Cav, these guys are out of supply at present. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark them with, with an emergency supply marker to show that that is their supply state. And I thought I had some of those pulled out. Let me get one here. Pull up the markers. Actually, I think I can just right-click on it. Yeah, here we go. Uh, both these guys are going to be in emergency supply. Now, if you're in emergency supply, there's no um, in a, there's no inhibitions on the the unit. The unit can move normally. It can engage in combat normally. There's not a big deal. Uh, it's just that next turn, if you're marked with an emergency supply marker and you're still out of supply, you can't trace the uh, general supply source. Then that marker is going to be flipped over, and there will be movement and combat restrictions. So for now, not a huge deal. So we've gone ahead and we've traced supply. So one other thing about supply that could be helpful is you do have these mobile supply units. Now the Germans have two of them on the map right now. The Soviets don't have any yet. Um, they're in the, the, the two that are on the map right now are trucks. Uh, mobile supply units come in two varieties. You have wagons, like the one I just dragged over here, and then you have trucks. The only difference between them is that the, uh, the trucks are orange movement rating capable guys, which uh, really only is, is an important factor when there's mud weather. Um, they move considerably slower if there's mud, even if they're on the road. Um, that's really the only difference is the movement rating between them. Uh, these guys are defenseless. If, uh, if an enemy unit enters the hex, the uh, MSU is eliminated. Um, these things are your lifeblood. In most scenarios, you are going to need these things to get anything done offensively because there are some pretty dire uh, dire modifiers against you if you attack without being able to trace, uh, I believe it is seven hexes, back to an MSU. And one MSU can fuel one attack. And these things are used to place units into what's called attack supply. And you need attack supply to be able to attack effectively in the game. So, and as I said, if you have the game, if you just joined us late, ordinarily this scenario, um, attack supply is irrelevant. All units are considered to have it, but for the purposes of this demo, we are using, um, I'm just, we're just going to play along and pretend like uh, they need uh, to have an MSU, just to show how this works. It's extremely important in most of the other scenarios.